to be the fire offering that we discussed in the lectures on Ta'at. Unfortunately, when that energy becomes very charged in the sexual organs and in the vital and astral bodies, humanity a long time ago was tempted to go further, to see how far they could take it, to have children on their own without the guidance of the Elohim. What happens then is that these energy transformers, the chakras and the sexual organs, short circuit. You see, a conductor only has a limited capacity. Any conductor of energy is like a, a channel or a tube through which energy can move. When you put too much energy there, you short circuit it. You create a loop or a, you create a, a misdirection of the energy and that circuit overloads and that energy escapes into other areas. This is the, what the orgasm is. It's an overcharge of energy. And that overcharge spills out of the sexual organs, out of the chakras, and into the surrounding ganglia, into the nadis. That's what we feel as an orgasm. And we think it's pleasurable because the root energy is. What we don't see is that that energy destroys. It destroys the organism gradually. This is why people who have a lot of sex gradually lose their sexual power. People who really become addicted to the orgasm and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it gradually lose the ability to have it. They become impotent or they become indifferent because these centers become burned out. Now, this is why we see everybody wants to take chemicals to stimulate their sex drive. And there are a lot of chemicals that you can get. This is why pornography became so popular. Because it, it is an artificial stimulation for the sexual energy. The problem is people are so addicted they don't realize that that energy is destroying them. It's put in the wrong places. That energy, which is extremely high voltage, is being put in places that cannot direct it and manage it. People go mad. The brain gets messed up. The nervous system gets messed up. This is why people who are addicted to masturbation and sex develop all kinds of mental and emotional problems. Many of them end up in sanitariums. We don't talk about this on the news. But as you look into it, you'll discover. Anyone who's worked in a mental hospital will tell you most of the people there are addicted to masturbation, the majority. Why? Because of desire run amok. Because that, as that energy destroys and destroys and destroys, it takes more and more energy to feel anything. People become desensitized, so they seek greater and greater forms of stimulation. In other words, more and more extreme sexual practices, little by little, lifetime to lifetime, gradually. Subsequently, the mind degenerates, the heart degenerates, the person becomes more and more of an animal. You can look around in the world and you'll see the evidence of this. Thus, the serpent is condemned to walk on the belly. Worse, God says, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. What is this dust? This dust is the dust that Adam comes from. Remember, Adam is taken from the dust and will return to the dust. We've talked about the dust in other lectures as well. This dust not only relates to the Adama, the ground, the body, it is also the archetypes of the soul. You see, the serpent is condemned. It cannot perceive the, the superior worlds, but it consumes the potential 
to realize them. This is a subtle Kabbalistic phrase that basically says the sexual energy, when polarized negatively, traps the consciousness in hell. The archetypes that we should be using to create the soul are trapped inside the ego. And thus the serpent eats dust. And it says, And I shall place enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. And this is that eternal, painful conflict that we have in sex because of desire. That enmity, that conflict that we always have sexually. We're in and out of relationships, in and out of love or lust or whatever we think it is. Satisfied for one moment and dissatisfied the next. Never finding what we're seeking. So all of this became heightened in, 19, in the 1960s. All of us can see that. When the age of Aquarius dawned and new cosmic forces were propelled against this planet, the Aquarian forces, which are very revolutionary, we saw our entire society turn upside down. And why? The two great things that emerged, spiritual longing, rejection of the old ways spiritually, and sexual longing. This is because the two are totally related. You cannot separate them. You cannot separate sex from religion. When that Aquarian force hit humanity, all of a sudden humanity says, where is the real religion? And where is real sexual satisfaction? These two questions emerged at the same time. That's because of the force of Aquarius, which is pushing humanity to begin a new era. Unfortunately, because the serpent in us is polarized in the wrong way, we began to experiment with sex and with religion, and with drugs, and with desire. And we had this so-called sexual liberation, which in fact has produced more suffering and problems than any kind of liberation. There's been more pain created from that than anything else. The same is true of this misguided spirituality that has emerged since this time where people think since the 60s that you can do whatever you want and make up your own religion and reach God. And this is a lie. The ancient religions are ancient because they have truths that cannot be avoided. Cannot be avoided. In synthesis, having understood some of the parameters of this energy, we need to understand that it is possible to return to Eden. There is a method. There is a way. All hope is not lost. That method is entirely inside of us. It does not depend on anything outside. It is psychological. It is spiritual. And to do it requires that we return to respecting the law. Do not fornicate. Do not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge. We have to learn to utilize those forces with respect. And that way invoke the Divine Mother to be present and guide us. Whether we're a single person or married, this is our work. The single person can utilize all the spiritual practices Prayer, meditation, pranayama, runes, many, many techniques. But if they don't do the psychological part, they will either gain nothing or just more suffering. We have to prepare an environment for the Divine Mother to inhabit. And that environment is inside of us psychologically.
This is why in the Bible, Jesus said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Both the serpent and the dove are symbols of the Holy Spirit. To be as wise as a serpent is to have this wisdom or knowledge of the polarity of Kundalini and to know how to use it. To be as harmless as a dove is to respect the law, to follow the guidance of God, not our own selfish will. Jesus also said we have to raise the serpent on a staff as Moses did. We do that by following the law. Moses raised the serpent, the fiery serpent, it says in the Bible, on a staff. This is how we work through Moses' willpower to raise the serpent up, Shushumna, to the brain. And as it ascends, it recovers all those lost senses so that we can see God again. And this process occurs in degrees, many degrees, 33 degrees in each body. And only Adam and Eve in cooperation can do this. In other words, a married couple. It's only a married couple that by combining the two bodies can create and originate enough energy to awaken the sleeping serpent. A person working by themselves cannot do this. It's impossible. Because a person by themselves cannot rectify the mistake that we made in Eden. That mistake can only be rectified by a man and woman who cooperate with each other. Furthermore, either a couple or a man and the woman working together can experience this energy. And there are many types of experiences that can emerge. When we talk about awakening of Kundalini in the Gnostic tradition, we're talking about spiritual birth. In some other traditions, Hinduism and Buddhism particularly, they talk about awakening Kundalini and they say even a single person can. In fact, even Shivananda says this, but he's not discussing the second birth. He's not talking about being born again, which is what we're talking about in Gnosis. When Shivananda or Naropa or Marpa or any of these teachers who talked about using Dumo or Kundalini and awakening that, they're talking about lighting a candle or lighting a match. When you meditate, when you practice, and you bring those conditions together so that flame can emerge, that is an awakening, but it's temporary. It will be there if there's fuel and conditions. And that's how you can have experiences in meditation. You can have comprehension, intuition, insight, experiences out of your body. All of these things are produced by that. But don't confuse the lighting of a match with the creation of a sun. The light that comes from a match is small and temporary. A sun, on the other hand, is a whole other level. And that's what the second birth is. The second birth is the emergence back into Eden. That awakening is completely different from sparks or flashes of Kundalini, Kundalini's energy activating a chakra. Be clear on that distinction. There are a lot of people in the world who talk about having experiences of awakened Kundalini but understand it in context. They may have these experiences, but it doesn't mean they're positive. They may be negative. They may also be fantasizing. They may also be lying. It doesn't matter.